Service exhibition was uh, quite a, I would say, dramatic and uh, uh, undertaking, uh, very ambitious. And it wouldn't be possible without, of course, Trish Stone, you know, the manager of the gallery. So I'm sorry, Trish, I, I yelled at you once, and I, I promise it will not happen again, uh, unless, it's, unless, unless, I, unless I lose it again. So uh, anyway, so uh, thanks a lot, uh, Todd uh, and Tracy, for uh, you know, all kind of incredible help. Uh, Hector, Mike, and AV team for making the show possible by providing and by finding equipment, which is not officially part of gallery equipment, but we found it somewhere. Uh, and uh, with general, you know, in general, our work at uh, our lab called Software Studies Initiative uh, is made possible by the support by uh, Kalati 2. So thanks to Larry and Ramesh. And our daily work, because our lab is housed at Circa, is made possible by, by Sheldon Brown. Uh, thank you, Sheldon, for your ongoing support and Circa uh, stuff. And then uh, we can get funding uh, from uh, different places, including UCSD, Kalati 2, Circa, NIH, NSF, uh, Singapore Ministry of Education. Uh, while we're not able to visualize data without having the data, uh, if possible, you know, whenever possible, we steal it. But in some cases, you know, people give it to us. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Cinematrics Project, uh, Austrian Film Museum, uh, Getty Museum, and Magnum Photos, uh, who kind of officially provided provided us with some of the data. And other, you know, and other, you know, other times, you know, we take it from you know illegally, or illegally from Project Gutenberg, you know, Google Books, Art Store. Uh, and uh, manga site. Uh, literally dozens of students have worked in the lab um, doing independent studies, internships, and we're also collaborating with researchers from our institutions uh, you know, from as far as uh, Singapore, Australia, Moscow, and Netherlands, and most importantly, our own ICAM students. Uh, so if you guys are interested, you know, we, you know, we do take you know, capable interns so talk to us after the show. Uh, so I think that's kind of the end of my introduction. Uh, so uh, in the work, you know, we work very collaboratively. You know, we program together, you know, we kind of yell at each other, we visualize together, we're trying to write articles together. So although on the labels of our artworks, you know, we try to specify, let's say, members of the lab who are primarily responsible for a particular project, you know, ultimately, you know, each of us, you know, contributed to practically every project. So instead of, uh, you know, going up here one by one, we decided that we'll take you through a show in the same order as the images are in the gallery. And then uh, maybe the discussion will be started by the person who maybe initiated and kind of drove a project, but maybe each of us will also contribute to the discussion. So we have 10 images, you know, 40 minutes, uh, so it's kind of four, Im four minutes per image. And uh, let's start. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to start with uh, Time Magazine visualization because it's the first thing you see. Uh, but instead of uh, starting with this long image, which is in front of a gallery, we're going to start with a different visualization of time which is presented as a 80 second animation inside the gallery. But here I'm going to show it as a still image. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, sure. So, um, Andrew, you just tell me zoom and zoom out. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Let's, let's stay zoomed in for a moment and just say one of the first most important things is we were looking at design within, um, the, within the frame. Time Magazine's most uh, iconic feature is the huge red box. Um, in order to make any visualization not look like 4,000 4, red boxes, we had to uh, crop every single image so that we could center on the design elements. That's what creates the visual effect that you're seeing as opposed to a huge grid of red. Um, as we move through close up, um, we, there are particular historical moments where, like right here at the bottom, uh, Time Magazine, oh, sorry, what I meant was oh. at that moment. Um, Time Magazine um, changed from a serif to a sans serif font, for example. Uh, the moments where you see a single design decision made that gets carried forward into the future, like it's an evolving artifact. But when we zoom out, um, we see these distinctive bands of color that um, 
and, and, and saturation and brightness um, that help us identify not just transitions in um, media printing techniques uh, style, but even particular eras like a light band um, uh, that maybe seems to echo our own era at the very bottom of the image and ties implicitly the, 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 two, the two times together and then leads us to dive in and consider the images more closely. Uh, what did other people want to? Yeah, well, I'll just add something. So, um, you know, the kind of meta idea of exhibition is to use visualization, right, as a mechanism to kind of make visible and to describe, you know, changes, kind of changes in time in cultural artifacts at different scales. You know, from a few seconds of a motion graphic piece to the dozens, you know, dozens or hundreds of years of print publication, right? Uh, and uh, what's interesting, you know, about, for example, you know, 4,535 covers of Time magazine, which spanned the period from 1923 until 2009, is in a few places we see like a kind of sharp change, right? Like Jeremy said, a single decision. But in most cases, whatever changes we see in content, in communication strategies, in composition and color, are always gradual, right? And uh, this implies that these changes are probably not the result of agency or decisions of particular people. Perhaps they represent some kind of underlying, you know, cultural unconscious, right? A kind of gestalt. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't know how specific this uh, particular patterns which we see here, unless we, you know, get the data, which I hope will happen soon, and visualize thousands of magazines. And then we'll be able to see if particular patterns we see here are unique or not. Uh, but uh, just mention maybe a couple of things which I found very surprising. I kind of thought you know the magazine will be black and white, and then at some point we'll switch to color. But even the switch is taking place over about ten years. So for about you know eight to ten years, the black and white and color coexist, and you can see how color is introduced in a very kind of subtle way through this red and green. Uh, borders and then slowly we we'll switch to full color images. Uh, another uh, interesting sort of, uh, again, kind of unexpected pattern you see here is that overall, over the course of 20th century, uh, the kind of aggressivity, right, you know, the, the intensity of communication increases, so it's not surprising that the contrast and the saturation of covers keep increasing but then in approximately you know, 10 years ago, maybe 10 or 12 years ago, there was a kind of unexpected change, and the covers you know, from the uh, last 10 or 12 years are much less saturated. We actually have lots of white, lots of silver. Okay. So maybe we move on to the next one. Right. Uh, so I think of uh, you know, uh, cultural artifacts such as 87 years of time, think of it metaphorically as a kind of body, right? And when you go and get your x-rays or CAT scans, uh, whatever medical imagery you, know, you can afford, right? You know, when you, or you, you kind of photograph your body from different points of view. Right? Each point of view reveals different patterns. So when we visualize the same set of cultural artifacts in different ways, uh, you know, each point of view makes visible, you know, allows us to see better certain patterns. So we're going to switch now to kind of side view. And zoom out. Okay. Sure, go. So, um, so some of the elements we were talking about in the last image are more dramatic and others less dramatic in this kind of um, timeline. Uh, you can see the the bright silver era of our present over on the far side of the image that Lev was talking about. And it certainly is a spatialized, dramatic cluster low down in the image in a very different way than the way you try to pick it out as a color band um, from, the, from the animation. Um, sim uh, similarly, uh, even though there is no line drawn, there's no trend, we're not averaging anything, when we do zoom out, there's, uh, there's a very strong sense of a kind of a, a line, uh, a through line that follows, and you can almost see waves going up and down um, in the line. Um, rises and falls that maybe, pr that maybe correspond to particular types of aggressivity or, or other things like that. And so it's interesting in some ways to think about what that, um, 
what that era, what that trend, what that collection is, and also look at the um, exceptions, the outliers, the floating dots that you see in the blackness high above or below the typical designs of their era, and, and um, zoom in to those. The most extreme form oh. of, uh, or, or the least, yes, and often, often those things are um, a cover from for uh, September 11th yeah. or a particular well, political. So I think in this case it's interesting since you know this period of history was really colorized right by the Cold War. It's interesting that the highest cover seems to be of Comrade Brezhnev, of the Soviet president, in a. You know, at the, in the early 60s, and uh, he's, he's, very, he's, you know, the most colorful image. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, we didn't do it, but it kind of fits, fits the discussion. Uh, one more thing I'd like to add. So, uh, this kind of visualization, and of course, we're also doing st statistical and mathematical analysis behind it, but in the exhibition we chose to focus on, you know, just visualizations, uh, allows us to talk about kind of what I call cultural variability, right? The kind of diversity, uh, of a cultural process at any particular time. So in this case, we can say, you know, what is the spread between the covers in terms of contrast and saturation at any particular moment? And you can see how just as kind of saturation increases, the spread is also increasing, but there are particular periods where the covers are more similar to each other, right? So the spread is smaller, and there are other periods where the spread is much larger. So it's a kind of example of a new dimension, right? A new cultural concept, which I think is very useful to talk about cultural history, which was really difficult to talk about without analyzing, visualizing large sets of data. Next one. Okay, the next one uh, is, um, so we talked about times where the scale is, the time, <coughs> in the time covers where the scale is dozens of years. So now we'll switch to all, also long cultural artifacts, but a little bit shorter. Uh, you know, so it's video games, which sometimes may take anywhere from 20 to 100 hours to play a single play, player game. And we're going to, yes, and we're going to, and we're going to use the same technique as in time, uh, kind of take the images and just put them in a grid in order. Okay. Uh, so the two images, which look very similar at first, are uh, visualizations of uh, a single player completing a whole game from beginning to end. We call this game traversal, and William will tell you what these games are. So the technique that I'm using here is something I actually picked up from uh, Jeremy with work he was doing with Colin Wheelock a couple of years ago. Um, and he was creating a suite of tools called Villings for an analyzing uh, uh, video games. And I, what the tools did were actually a lot more complex and detailed than what I actually ended up taking out of it. Um, but I used some of those tools for analyzing uh, the Kingdom Hearts series of games. They're a series of video games that are, came out of a collaboration between a uh, Japanese software company and uh, the Walt Disney Company. And what I found the most compelling was one of the most simple uh, techniques, simply producing montages, a sequence of still images that flattened the timeline out from, uh, from sessions of gameplay to produce visualizations that would give us at one glance uh, an ability to look at patterns that emerged over, over the play session. Um, these games tend to take uh, a long time to play. Uh, one of these games that uh, took me uh, 60 hours to play, another took about 30 hours. Yeah, so I think in this case, this is, I think, Kingdom Hearts 1, which is 62 and a half hours. Right. So this is 62, hour, 62 and a half hours of a cultural experience. And the second one is Kingdom Hearts 2, which is, I think, 37 hours. Right, right. And, um, one of the key, the choices we have to make when we're making these visualizations is exactly what sampling rate we're going to choose. There's always a, a series of trade-offs you make between granularity of representation and uh, having enough of, a, of, a, of an objective um, distance from the whole thing that you, that you can actually see and, and conceptualize the patterns. So this game works through... Um, this game involves a single character who navigates through these different worlds. Each of these worlds uh, is a different franchise, a different Disney property. And these Disney properties are, you can distinguish them by the characters that are in them, but also by the palettes that are used, their kind of stylistics. So the, the banding you get is a result of moving from one world to the other over the course of multiple sessions of play. Um, if you, uh, again, if you zoom out completely, you'll see some of the bands recur because in practice you actually move back and forth between different worlds. It's not a, a linear progression. 
Um, one of the reasons why I find this technique uh, useful is that uh, video games are by their nature veriform. There's not a canonical mode of traversal through any one. Uh, this, is to, this is the production of an intermediary artifact that lets you uh, treat something that doesn't have a single canonical timeline <coughs> uh, as having one by choosing as the artifact of, of uh, engagement, not the game itself, but the act of unpacking it, the, the game, the game play. Um, so I took this, um, this idea farther with the, uh, the next visualization. Yeah, I just I want to add something. Um, so um, this kind of color band which you see here, I think are very important because they represent a fundamental difference between 21st century media and 20th century media, right? So 20th century media, things like films, were organized around narratives. But today, you know, a company creates properties Right, so they create characters and worlds, and then from these characters and worlds, we craft outputs on different media, which may include video games, you know, interactives on the web, uh, films, toys, and so on. Right, so a narrative is just one kind of way to render, so to speak, right, to output uh, the media property, which was organized around characters and worlds. So the fact that the narrative here is not like a linear kind of progression or even a curve, and you'll see example of a curve in a, you know, a little bit later, but in fact, a kind of navigation from a database, right? A navigation through a set of separate worlds, so you can visit in different Disney properties, uh, and I don't know how exactly it is connected, um, I guess there's a storyline or not, I'm not even sure, uh, and it's something which is seen in the game. And also, this is Kingdom Hearts 1 from 2002, and this is Kingdom Hearts 2, from 2005, mm -hmm. so you see right away certain differences in color and maybe also in a kind of in the kind <coughs> of rhythm of play. Right. Oh, I just thirty, still thirty seconds. From yeah. Oh, sure. Actually, go ahead. So okay, if you so look in the a, yeah. in uh, Kingdom Hearts two, for example, this one. there's um you see certain segments that are um that are in uh, grayscale and black and white essentially. There's a world within the game, which is a remediation of the Disney animations from the from the early 20th century and so you see that palette and a lot of the uh, distinction of worlds can be you can immediately identify them by changes in the palette from one world to the next uh, and closer inspection with the images too some this this game franchise is generally very cinematic in terms of the range of of uh, possible positions in relationship to cinema that video games can take and even even so the uh, the extent to which it is not cinema is really becomes apparent. The, the, the way that the, the, the temporalities of uh, video games work themselves and the way that the, the signs appear and reappear has almost nothing to do with cinema. And I think that's something that, as you spend more time with these images, becomes more immediate. Okay, yeah. so we'll go to a crawl? Oh, really? oh, sorry, Jeremy, go very, ahead. very briefly, just synthesize something that when, <coughs> when William was talking about um, the variability of um, of, of gameplay and the idea of this is an intermediate object and what Lev is talking about the kind of uniqueness of a sort of place and character based mm -hmm. media production. I think the really important thing for me about that is that um, the final um, uh, you know prints that William has assembled in some way represent one view in on a set of hundreds of th or thousands of potential prints you could imagine that are the records of all of the different people who have each experienced this game in a slightly different way. And when you start to imagine the way in which all of those prints would look essentially the same, and yet they would always be different orderings of different cross-sections of the database that Lev refers to, you start to imagine viscerally what it takes to come to grips with this kind of object, an object that takes each person 60, two hours to experience in a different way. Okay, so shall we go to a crawl? Sure. Okay. Um, well, uh, okay, so the next, um, the next image is actually not the image, it's um, uh, frames from the animation, which is playing also in the gallery. Uh, you'll see it in the back wall on the horizontal monitor, and it's a different visualization of a kind of playthrough of the same game. Uh, so it's about 13,000 frames. This is frame four, this is a frame so 4,000, 8,000, 13,000, and William can explain oh, to you. Why do you leave the last one up there? Last one, right? Yeah. Uh, and essentially what this thing does is it kind of like segments or remaps 
the gameplay experience and the two different dimensions. Right. So what this visualization shows is the um, along the the x-axis is actually the day in which or a session a different session of play, and each session is a, a stop and start of recording period, and um, the saving of a game, me walking away and, and turning off the machine, etc. The vertical uh, the vertical dimension is the different fictional worlds. So There's 16 different worlds you, tra you traverse as you play the game. Um, and the animation plays out in a chronological order of play. So this is um, kind of a, a 3N uh, um, representation of some of the different temporal dynamics of gameplay. Um, and I think it also affords a different uh, different understanding on when different elements, different uh, representational elements are recurred, they're borrowed from, from each other, and yet how um, distinctive layers of space are, are produced through the game. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this kind of visualization is, to me, you know, and this is something William invented, I've never seen it before, so um, it's very promising, because again, you know, when we think about difference between 20th century media in 21st century media. Yes, of course, you know, if you watch a film, you, you read a novel, you have your personal individual experience, but there is a kind of stable text, right? So literally critics or film scholars or architecture scholars, you know, would study this text, right? The text of a novel, the film, or other cultural artifacts. Well, today we live in the age of interactive media, right, which is a software and maybe some media elements, but then these actual artifacts, you know, actualized, right? when you interact with them, right? So in the case of a game, you know, there is no, su there is no such a thing as a single game, right? There are multiple game instances. Uh, every time you play a game, you get a different kind of game version. So what I like about this visualization is that it really makes visible, uh, you know, the, that, that the kind of game experience is, is interaction between the, the structure of experience, right? The structure of gameplay, the fact that you finish this game in about 30 separate sessions, and the structure of a game, right? So the structure of a gameplay, the separate gameplay sessions on one dimension, and the different worlds on another dimension. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Ready for the next one? Okay, ready for the next one. Okay, so now um, we're going to um, sort of, so, so we're kind of, right, we're kind of traveling in time. We started with about 86 years of time covers. <coughs> now, it's, uh, it's, uh, is this Kingdom Hearts 1 or 2, William? That was... Uh one. One. So that's about, yeah, so that's 60 hours of gameplay. Now we're going to zoom out and look at uh, 12 years of uh, design, specifically the design modifications of original Google logo. So every time you guys go, right, uh, to Google, you notice that uh, the logo is different every day. In fact, the differences are getting more and more crazy. So we're interested to look at the space of variations, right, how much the designers can modify the logo, but still keep some kind of DNAs intact so you can identify what it is a Google logo. So again, the space of variability, the space of design variations. And Jeremy, who initiated this project, will talk about it. So some, some of our projects, oh. um, specifically, I mean, the, the manga one, but also working with um, some of the uh, art, uh, art gallery images, things like that, some of them have involved months and months of data acquisition and data processing and writing custom software. And this is really something that, um, a large portion of it was sort of done in a single afternoon as a sketch. You know, sometimes that sometimes it just works out that way. Like write a web spider, grab every Google logo ever. They put them all on one nice page for you. You can go download them yourself if you want to, and they put more as they produce them every day. Uh, the Google logos image come with some interesting metadata. Um, which context they were published oh, in? Look at this. Oh, right now it's normal. Huh. But that's that's really outlier, right? Yeah, that's yeah. So absolutely. Anyway, it's a sort yeah. of a okay. Well, maybe we'll check. Maybe, maybe we'll check at the end of the discussion. But actually, right? if you go to the bottom of the, um, if you go to the, um, uh, I don't know if it's about Google or if you I just go know, to so Google slash Pages. I think was the last yeah, place they were keeping no. it. You can actually go yeah. see the go like, or type think, in Google I think it's logos. Like, I think it's, yeah, here um, it is, right? Yeah, there they are. So we just so they got have a full archive. Set, yeah, here it is, um, right. And and one of the important things is there isn't one Google homepage, right? There are dozens of Google homepage for different national contexts, and Google changes the logos on sometimes on all of them for international figures, sometimes on only a subset of them for particular holidays, uh, sometimes on only one of them for the observance of their Regency, or or Independence Day, right? So. There are many, many Independence Day logos. Most of them are only shown in specific country 
homepages. Um, luckily, anyone who uses the Google.com homepage gets a huge helping of American culture, too. So, um, so that's kind of the way that the data sorts out. So, so the, the one thing I will say about this is that um, this was a multi-dimensional cloud that we tried to sort of flatten and arrange by what was most interesting, and that unlike most of the other projects where we were measuring or arranging things about the images per se, the time covers as such, here every image is being judged implicitly in relationship to the canonical Google logo. So the ways these images are all arranged in this cloud um, Yes, th thank you, yeah, perfect. Right. The way these images are arranged in this cloud, all of them have been um, registered or automatically aligned against that original logo, like two transparencies. And then the light, the interference pattern that shines through, the place where a flag was added instead of an L, or grass was drawn onto the bottom that isn't there in the original, that's what is being measured, the, the difference. And, and that's, that's the logic that organizes the cloud. So you can see the extreme difference on the far right-hand side yeah. and the almost negligible right. difference right. over on the far so, left. So maybe actually, so if, if we had to place the original logo, it would be at the extreme left border of the image. And then the distance, you know, the horizontal distance bet between each logo and the left border is like the amount of modification. Is it literally how many how many pixels change? So it's something more complex. Uh, it's, more, it's, more it's, complex. it's a little more complex. So it's some kind of measure of difference, but, visual yeah. difference. It's kind of like a yeah, like an interference pattern. Right, and then ver and then vertical dimension shows you another type of difference, which is in logos which have mostly modifications at the bottom, at the bottom, and logos which are mostly have modifications on the top on the top. So it's a way, you know, there is multiple ways to define difference, multiple dimensions of difference. So what we're doing is using two-dimensional space to organize logos in terms of two different types of difference. Yeah. And, um, you know, this is, an interesting, uh, this is an interesting space to browse through and see the way different uh, riffs on the Google logo tend to arrive at similar solutions, similar um, Olympics, Olympic athletes tend to end up in similar areas of the space. Flags tend to end up in similar areas of the space. Seasons, not because there's anything inherent about the idea of a season. Mm -hmm. um, flags but, here, for example. Yeah, fla flags yeah. there, for example. But simply because given a Google logo and given certain subject matter, um, uh, the sets of artists that worked in this project often arrive at similar design solutions or fall mm -hmm. into design traditions. Yeah, and uh, so as we kind of begin to think about you know the space of you know the space of innovation the space of variability it's interesting right what are the shapes of the spaces in this case I mean it's not hard to say but uh, overall you know the shape of design modifications of Google logo reminds us of a very familiar kind of Gaussian normal distribution right where most of the data in the center when you have outliers on the sides and outliers here are both logos on this little modification and a larger set of logos on this side with uh, uh, more modifications. So of course it would be interesting when to apply the same techniques to our type of cultural data uh, to see if, you know, what kind of distributions we're going to get. Jeremy, anything William, else? Or? William, did you want to say no, anything about this? Okay, that's, right. that's good for me. So, um, so uh, now we'll show you a kind of our larger project, which I hope in five years we're going to think is very small. Uh, but for now, it's a large one. It's an uh, anal analysis and visualization of uh, one million manga pages. So as you guys know, manga are Japanese kind of comics, you know, very popular around the world. Um, and we, you know, this is an example of a project where it took us months to download data, it took us months to clean it up. Uh, we um, took us eight months to port our software to a uh, supercomputer at National Energy Research Center. And then it only took supercomputer half an hour to process the data, <laughs> so you kind of wonder. Uh, but now comes the exciting part where we're actually able to analyze this data. And we'll show you just a couple of images from this analysis. Uh, in fact, I'll show you a couple of versions. So the whole data consists from 883 different manga series. This includes, you know, some very short series which maybe just appeared like for a week and then were not picked up, and also some of the most popular series today, such as Naruto, uh, Bleach, One Piece, Vampire Night. Uh, so, in the case of, uh, for example, this most popular series, we've been running continuously for 11 or 13 years. 
So for the, for the top series, we have over 10,000 pages. Uh, but this visualization doesn't really show you time. It actually, again, shows you the space of different stylistic possibilities, right? The space of different visual variations of this whole slice of a kind of manga culture. Um, so this is um, about 5% of our data, okay? okay? And uh, I'll discuss the dimensions in a second. And then, uh, you know, as you go from 5% to 100, so it's about 50,000 pages. As you go from 50,000 pages to 1 million pages, the shape is the same, but you basically get more outliers, right? So if you go to 1 million pages, it basically looks like this, okay? Uh, Okay. Now, what are the dimensions here? So, um, I'm actually going to use this image because, oh, sorry, not this one. I apologize, because it's a bit high resolution. Uh, so, um, we use techniques, you know, which come from fields of image processing and computer vision. And these techniques, some of these techniques are 50 or 60 years old. Some of them are being developed today. And uh, these techniques can get very, very complex. But we really want these methods to be usable to you know, students, individual, creatives, uh, you know, people who teach humanities and media. So we can use very, very simple measurements to get at some important dimensions of culture. We're very happy. So uh, since there were probably some ICAM students here who probably took some calculus, this is an audience where I can actually mention some technical terms, which makes me really happy. Uh, so the X dimension is standard deviation. Right, standard deviation of all pixels in the image. So what it basically means in practice is that the pages, which are just have like a single tone, you know, gray, white, or black, are on one side, and then the pages, which are consists from uh, just a few areas of black and white, so the kind of variance in pixel values is very large, are on the different size. So that's like one dimension of, let's say, style or visual language of manga. And then just as with Google logos, we're using the second dimension, vertical dimension, to map, um, to represent sort of another aspect of visual style. So specifically, uh, and the measurement here, if you guys want to know, is entropy. So the logos, again, which are, have very little texture, very little detail, are appear at the bottom. And then as we go up, uh, we start seeing more texture, more detail, more realism, if you want to use this word. It also takes longer uh, for artists uh, to draw these logos until we get to the top of this mountain, right, this kind of manga, the end of our manga universe, the edge of our manga universe, and we get pages which are incredibly realistic in detail. Well, um, since we kind of want to leave time for questions, I'm only going to say one thing about it. So for me, uh, the most important thing about this visualization, and maybe one of the most important things which is coming from our research, is that, you know, normally, you know, people in humanities or media studies never really analyze data at that size. So we use concepts like you know, period, artistic school, style, to talk about culture, and everything looks fine. And it turns out that when we're going to and start looking at much larger cultural data set, such as one million manga pages, this concept no longer work, and in fact, we need to have different concepts. So what's interesting here is that uh, the space of variation, right, the space of variation from the logos, which are you know, very kind of graphic and have very little detail, Right? And then we're going up, and eventually we arrive at, uh, sorry, not logos, I'm sorry, manga pages, which are, which are very, very detailed and very textured, but there are no breaks in between, right? So every possible variation, every possible kind of change in values is realized, which means that, you know, if I'm to talk about style of manga, in this case, it's kind of meaningless, right? Because how would I divide the space? Like, would I, would I for example, draw the line here and call all this logos graphic? Would I draw a line here and call the logos at the uh, so, sorry, would I, would, I, would I draw a line here and draw and call this li uh, logos graphic? And then would I draw a line here and call the logos on top very detailed? But where to draw a line, right? So uh, it's a kind of space of continuous variation, right? And uh, so it's much better to represent it as a curve. Uh, so mathematics and visualization seems to provide a better language since we allow us to represent you know, lots and lots of differences between artifacts, and it would be hard to properly uh, represent it with language. Okay, and uh, maybe we should... Uh, okay, great, uh, yeah. So maybe I'll just show you one more thing very briefly. Uh, so this is uh, like the whole million pages, 
kind of projected into a single space, like we call it a style space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can also uh, use a different technique of uh, call matrix scatterplot to compare uh, different manga series uh, with each other. And uh, this is this visualization. So it's a similar scatter plot, in which case uh, each plot represents a single manga series. So this is about one fourth of our data set. So it's about a uh, couple of hundred manga series. So it's about uh, 250,000 pages. So again, you know, each manga series is plotted using the same dimensions, actually exactly the same dimensions as in the previous plot. Uh, and uh, each point corresponds to a single page. And what's useful about these visualizations is that we immediately show you uh, which artifacts, in this case, which manga series really stand out, right? So for example, you can say, well, this one is really something interesting about this one. Let me look at this more closely. Or maybe there's something interesting about this one, right? So it's a kind of example of using visualization to explore a very large set of cultural data uh, and then find kind of interesting patterns. So you can call this kind of cultural data mining. There, there's um, really two approaches that we can go and we, we avail ourselves of both of them. One is really this, this approach is driven by the page itself as an object of the data that's latent within it once you analyze it. And we also have some metadata. Um, and the metadata can be cross-indexed. And, and once we've identified these kind of spaces and regions and these gradations of, uh, of style, we can see if they correspond to uh, different distributions for those t uh, titles which are uh, meant for, for men as a market, as a thing for those which are uh, targeted towards women, uh, those which are um, distributed in one country or another, other kind of um, uh, systems of metadata can be interpreted um, in conjunction with these kind of analysis. They're not by any means exclusive. But when you start from this form of exploration, it makes it um, somewhat more um, available to see uh, emergent categories, emergent genres, and uh, not necessarily be restricted by the categories that have been handed down by, by practice and convention. Well, I think uh, we should maybe, right, maybe, maybe stop a little time for questions. And I just want to say that, so some of these images are displayed as prints in the gallery. A couple of these projects are shown as animations on the 30-inch screens in the gallery. But then four of these images also represent frames from animations, which will be playing uh, on the monitors in the hallway. But you know, you know how things are in computer graphics. It's actually rendering right now. So when the render finishes, you'll see them next week. Mm -hmm. But uh, meanwhile, uh, I just want to say that uh, you know all all our uh, all you know all our images are on our Flickr uh, account. It's a CultureViz. And you can always visit our website, Software Studies, uh, to get more information or to get more involved in our research. So, you know, we kind of put everything online. And we welcome, you know, Flickr, I think the comments are open. So we welcome your comments uh, and discussion. And let's start discussion right now. Uh, there are there are a few. Okay, so to briefly repeat the question, um, why organize this large style space of manga pages that you see in terms of level of detail? Why use that as one of the things that we use to navigate? How is that interesting or in, or, or important or significant? I think there are a few answers to that. Um, one of them, uh, one of them actually does have to do with genre and style. That there are interesting correspondences with the way Sai like. Um, uh, historical war dramas or um, dating, you know, romances for um, young adult women um, compare against kind of fighting stories for 13-year-olds, and often there does seem to be some some correspondence, although a continuous curved correspondence to these kinds of established categories. Um, another reason that's interesting is that there is an actual um, both sort of uh, 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 you know, a sort of design convention and a maybe a physiological 
connection between the fact that pages with more detail take longer to look at. So in some ways, when you're, when you're experiencing not just something with gradients, but something with a lot of intricately done line work, um, you're looking at how slow or how fast a page is to move your eye across, and that can have both narrative implications and aesthetic implications for the um, experience space, not just the texture. Um, so reading entropy out of an image is in some ways a, a brutalist mathematical operation. You know, it, releases, it reduces each page to a number. But there's a potential connection to a lot of really rich introspection about art style there. Yeah, I just want to say, so w w the direction where this work is going is we're kind of working on the article now where we're uh, looking at the kind of connections between uh, manga markets. So manga has four markets for teenage girls, teenage boys, young men and young women. So it's age and gender. Uh, manga, uh, uh, manga, uh, so different uh, genres, so there's like 30 genres, and then the style, right? And what we're finding is that, for example, there's definitely a difference between visual language for boys and for girls, but as Jeremy said, it's like a soft difference. And like, you know, so basically if I would divide these clouds, and I can show you these visualizations into like boys and girls, they're going to have different centers, but overlap. But another thing I want to say, so traditional cultural criticism, right? You pick out particular cultural artifacts, which are important, and you look at particular dimensions of this artifacts, editing style, you know, gender, narrative. And I think it's all fine, but, you know, today we can basically say, let's look at all artifacts and let's look at every single dimension. So in this case, this visualization, I mean, I think it's interesting, it's beautiful, it's meaningful, but we can basically produce thousands of our visualizations where we would organize images by different parameters, right? So don't think of it as like the finite you know, fin final output, it's one output out of many, uh, but it took like two hours, two, took two days to render this on IMAX, so, uh, you know, I hope I can render more, but it's just, let's say, just one, it's one window into a multi-dimensional space of difference. Yeah, there's a, I think there's a couple of directions this can go. This is something that uh, Jeremy and I have spoken a great deal about, and he's actually started to do some work, which is to mine the visual field of gameplay for its semantics, for taking things like health bars and, uh, and number of lives and other metrics. Uh, the uh, video games tend to have a lot of recurring semiotic features to it that are stable. And because they have this, and generally cinema doesn't, um, you can take these techniques, you can take a, 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 a range of very well-developed computer vision techniques and turn them into essentially a tablature of play. That's something that he has yeah. worked with in the past, and it's definitely something that can that uh, that <coughs> I'm interested in proceeding in the future. So, in particular, with the, the Kingdom yeah. Hearts. Oh, oh sorry, yeah. I, I, I was like, I was actually. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. no problem. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In case oh, yeah. you want to talk about. Oh, this. sure. Um, well, in the case of the, the the Kingdom Hearts too, because this is created as a. Um, uh, a sort of uh, collection of visits of, to worlds that themselves are different Disney properties. One place I want to go next is to actually compare the, the visual features of each of these different worlds with those in the original properties. Uh, compare the, the kind of interactive version of Tarzan with um, the, the filmic one produced by, by Disney and see if we can find patterns in, in difference uh, in uh, interactive diegesis and interactive world ways of producing fictional worlds from traditional narrative and cinematic ones. And I'd like to add one thing since um, William just talked a lot about my work, I'll just talk about his. Um, I was not I was not crazy enough to ask even five different people to all record 60 hours of the same game so that I could compare all the recordings, but William was. So he's definitely already kind of thinking in this direction and working and working on it. When you look at endeavors like this, um, people like, uh, you know, Microsoft Labs, Ni Bungie, have built sort of professional studios that this is kind of what they do, and they have a very inside out um, hooks built into the original software, bug testing, let's hit the gold master CD kind of approach, where it's all about kind of working out experience before it arrives at the audience in order to predict what is a successful or unsuccessful play. That's very different from um, 
understanding what the distribution and variability is in hundreds or thousands of people that play something and and they and people in these testing labs are reading differently because they care about different things so this kind of um, the, the this kind of work is I think in some ways um, very similar and yet it's profound it's it's a profoundly different set of questions yeah well I think okay so here's what I think uh, I have to actually double check so uh, when, we, when we started doing these visualizations where you know we would basically just take two visual features and I saw that we you know that the image you know the, the distributions have this kind of geometric shape so then uh, I haven't done it for these features but for example I've done it for like mean and standard deviation and I made like a set of artificial images and then I realized that all possible images will be inside you know, some defined geometric shape like a semicircle, and I think this is because the features are correlated. So I think because of correlations of visual features, you know, it's impossible to make the image which will go here, right? Uh, but I would have to kind of, you know, we haven't checked this mathematically, right? But that'll be interesting kind of question. Uh, but what we find very useful is kind of projecting you know, different cultural artifacts in the same feature space. So for example, we can compare, you know, different artists, and you can also ask, well, you know, so manga style, you know, how come we don't have any manga like in this style, right? So, so obviously there is this distribution uh, and there is a kind of focus on particular part of possibilities and our possibilities are not realized. So we also think about it, and again, this is very informal, it's like biological evolution, right? You know, the evolution realized in millions of species, but not every possible combination of, you know, legs and arms was realized, right? So it's kind of thinking in this direction. Uh, it's also it's also worth noting that um, you know some parts of the image are mathematical limits and some of them are actually naturally sparse. But also, if you look at the um, we, and we experienced a similar thing with the uh, with working with art images, there are certain artifacts of the digital production chain, the way that things get put into print and then get scanned, and the qualities of the scanners, and then the way they get encoded as JPEGs and downloaded. That means that. Um, it means that even if you were randomly generating images and putting them into the beginning of that pipeline, you would never get a pure white image out of the end, right, for example. So these are scanlations. They're, p they're fans that are actually grabbing the books, chopping the bindings off, and throwing them hot onto scanners the morning they come out in Japan so that international readers can um, write hand translations onto the, onto the tops of the JPEGs and then re-upload them. And after that image has been printed, re-scanned, um, edited in Photoshop and then resaved to a compressed format. Um, there are certain things about the digital artifact that the shape tells us that um, you can either think of it as an artificial limitation of imperfect data or you can think of it as a deep reflection. I mean, these are the kinds of images that most of the global readership are reading and that's where they end up distributed partly because of that digital chain. Yeah, I just want to show one image when we decided not to include any visualizations of paintings in the exhibition, but, uh, you know, since we have a couple of minutes. So this is an example of how we can like, take different data sets and project them into the same space. So we're comparing works of uh, different artists. This is uh, Mondrian, this is Mark Rothko, so kind of first generation abstract artist, right, from 1904 to 1917 second generation abstract artists from 34 to 1970. And this is the simplest possible features, right? Which is brightness and saturation. And what's interesting is, you know, we can overall, you know, like shapes are kind of similar. And what's interesting, for example, are these distances between the paintings. So every painting is a little bit different. But what is also interesting, you don't see it here. Um, if we add time, you'll find out that Mondrian, he starts here with dark paintings. When he goes here, and he ends up here, right? So his career is like this kind of semicircle. And Rovka, who, who starts, you know, his kind of surrealist abstract painting 30 years later, he starts right here. He starts in the same place where Mondrian ends, even he goes all over, when he goes here and here, right? Uh, so we find that, you know, it's a very kind of basic technique, but it hasn't been used before, right? For cultural data, kind of projecting cultural artifacts into the same space gives us a new way to compare. You can also connect with the whole history of our history, right? Some of us are old enough to take our history classes where people will have two slide projectors and compare two images. Well, if we want to make sense of, you know, billions of images on Flickr or find interesting patterns about contemporary design or architecture, 
we need to be able to compare millions of images, and this is you know one one way to do that. Do you, you think? Ahead, I you? think I think there's something normative about the image that it's claiming. Like um, speaking for the the game traversals, um, well, they're they're documentary. That's how I went through it, and um, um, considering how long it takes to go through a game, I'm not inclined to make a much larger data set of my own traversals through the game. Um, so I guess there's a, a kind of a, an implicit claim of typicality rather than canonicity that this traversal is, uh, is typical for someone in my position who takes as long as I do to finish a game. Uh, in the case of the crawl for someone who has you know, the economy of time that I do, of leisure time. And one of the things that can emerge from these sort of things is that economy of leisure time that can be that's that's a, a trait and it's very specific to the moment in which that that artifact's been discharged, been, which it's been uh, it's been instantiated. Um, the um, I think that um, <coughs> um, I don't know. Do you want to speak to? Yeah, the, I, I'd like to add something that I think I think there's there are a few levels. I mean, there's one level at which the 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 first the first thing I I, I get from your comment, I think about the way that the sort of the the way the tyranny of the visual constructs mm. constructs a kind of truth through all of the um, all of the options that it doesn't make, and no matter how many times you say, well, there are 50 potential axes here. Here are just two of them, but there are the just two of them that are 40 feet long at, at you know 1,200 DPI, yeah. right? You yeah. know, they're pretty pretty well chosen. Just just two. Um, uh, maybe maybe the desire for visualization is so seductive that it ultimately elides the space, mm. or maybe that desire does lead to more production. I think in some ways we try to gesture towards distributing our software tools and talking a lot about workflows and options. I mean, the way we propagate our art is, is, is really, no matter how glossy the paper, we talk a lot about process and hopefully um, the desire for visualization that is so seductive is in part a desire not just to accept it as the truth, but also to make more of it, which mm -hmm. may, who knows if the, who knows if, if hair of the dog is the right, you know, <laughs> is, is the right response, but, but maybe. I, I have one other very quick response to what you're saying is, in the case of manga specifically, um, I think another big problem is there's a, there's a tendency to say, this is global manga, when actually this is the global manga in the premier English translated archive for it that was web accessible that we scraped at this snapshot date. So the new canon is the digital image, right? If you say, this is every essay on this topic that I was able to find on Google right now. Right, like that's the new that that's the new the new canon is it's it's completely arbitrary, it's absolutely mm -hmm. inclusive. Uh, but the way in which what's included and excluded is whatever we happen to have in the data we collected at that moment. So we don't make claims about, um, about judgment, but um, we try to include everything in, in any given image, but ultimately that is its own kind of decision um, uh, to go with what's available, and that will always sort of bias in, uh, in other ways, although ultimately I think the fantasy is that um, in the case of Time Magazine covers, for example, um, we believe that's very, very close at this point. We can see places where that's closed to the moment where um, somebody who owns every copy of Time Magazine and someone who looks at our work would find that there's not a huge gap between what we're doing and what they imagine. Yeah, I just want to add something. So I think uh, if I understand Sean's question, I mean, it's an excellent question about well, so why do we select these particular features to, you know, to organize uh, a map of artifacts, since there are millions of ways to do it? And I think there are kind of three kind of forces. One is, let's use the simplest possible techniques, right, and see what these techniques, you know, can, uh, can give us. So uh, I think we kind of forgot to talk about this one, mm. but this is in the gallery. So this is a webcomic Freak, Freak Angels. And uh, it's published in a weekly. So every week we publish six pages. So there's 57 episodes. And we said, let's use the simplest possible kind of feature, conceptually, like, br like average brightness, and map it out. And you find that with, with this amazing curve, right? So visual form of a comic changes very gradually over many, many months. And this is interesting enough, you know? It's like because it's kind of like counterintuitive. 
right? So, mm -hmm. for example, so that's one thing. And the second thing is, so I think when we work with any data, and I think maybe the same thing applies to, you know, social scientists or scientists, sometimes you start from a kind of bottom up. You said, okay, I can measure something. Let me kind of visualize this measurement and see if it's interesting, right? Uh, so this, I think, kind of applies to Manga. So we said, you know, we measured like, eight different features <coughs> and we made all possible plots. And we found out that, this, that the feature of entropy gives us a kind of nice way to organize our material in terms of most graphic and most detailed. And, you know, when you think about not just manga, but graphic art, you know, I know Rembrandt, cartoons, you know, drawings, it's a pretty powerful, you know, it's a pretty important dimension. So it's a dimension kind of, you know, worth, uh, worth displaying. Uh, and, uh, and then I think a third maybe approach to say, well, you know, if I'm looking at particular data, I can see that there are certain visual dimensions on which we can find important difference, important patterns. So let's just try it out, right? So for example, in the case of Monde and Rovka, uh, was kind of, for me, it was kind of intuitive to say, okay, let's organize these paintings by kind of brightness and saturation, both because I think these are actually important dimensions for modern art. Uh, we see imp interesting differences, and also these features are really simple to measure, right? We don't have, to, I mean, we can do much more complex mathematical techniques, multi-dimensional scaling, blah, 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 but we're going to lose most of people, so let's see if we can get something with very, very simple techniques. Uh, yeah. uh, but in the same time, you know, to me, this is one of the advantages, this is one of the unique features, right, of digital media, is that everything you see on the screen, right, everything you see in the gallery is just one version out of a million versions, right? It's one of the features of digital media, it's a kind of parametric system, so I think this question, why did you choose this one, mm -hmm. can also apply to uh, all works of modern architecture, right? Why did the architect chose this particular set of parameters and then build this you know, hundred million dollar building, right? I, I just want to add one thing to that, which is this, um, th for me, there's a, there's a powerful um, medical metaphor that has to do with this strategic simplicity of measurement. And that is, to, if, you're, if you're looking at something as, as complex and sometimes ineffable as, as human art or human cultural production, it can be jarring or really disturbing to say, oh, well, I, I, I took a mathematical measurement of one aspect of the pixels, and, and yours, your, your painting is a 47, and this one is a 53. And you're like, well, thank you. I'm so glad you understand my work, you know, right? <laughs> like, um, it can be, I mean, beyond disturbing. But when I think, um, uh, like, my hands are sweating right now. There are multiple ways, there are multiple simple measurements in medical science for stress. There are some complex ones too, but there are various things that have to do with, you know, electrical conductivity, the moisture of your, the moisture of your skin, you could measure your heart rate, you could do things like that. Now, the way in which your heart rate is correlated with the feeling of stress, however multiple people would define that, is incredibly complicated if we could even agree on what stress is. But there are many, many ways in which medical science will constantly go to incredibly simple metrics that are not causation, but they're correlated to profoundly important experiences of the human condition. And they involve all kinds of little wobbly graphs on, on screens in hospital rooms that have almost nothing to do with the complexity of your father or your daughter's body, but it's good enough. It's actually telling us interesting things that we want to know. Yeah. So that that's also a powerful metaphor for me is that strategic simplicity isn't just for like math nerds. It like works for people who care about humans too. And the medical is a good is a good category where I where I see that. Yeah, I just want to show you guys, you know, one more thing uh, as a way of answering these questions. So. Uh, let me show you a couple of uh, animations, which are kind of different ways, right? Different, different ways to look at the same kind of data, right? The same space, and uh, and this is uh, also you know example where we don't use single feature, we use combination of features to measure difference. And the technique again, kind of simple PCA. Uh, well, you know, if you have a multi-dimensional space where you know every dimension is a particular visual feature, right? Well, lots and lots of ways in which you can projected in two dimensions. So I'll show you two animations, which are both using the same measurements in visualized career of Mondrian. And the details of these animations are different, but I think where kind of deep meaning is the same. So you'll see how his paintings in the beginning are very similar. And then as his <coughs> career develops, the painting become much more diverse, 
but the actual details, the actual story, each animation will tell you is going to be a little bit different because of the different mapping of multi-dimensional multi space into two-dimensional space.